Hi guys, it's Laura and you're watching Laura X Annie and today I am here with part two of my Understanding Hamlet series and this is Act 1, Scenes 3 to 5. So if you haven't seen my first part, it'll be in the eye there. Click on it, watch it and then let's continue. So let's get straight into this. The active, headstrong and affectionate Laertes contrasts powerfully with the contemplative Hamlet, becoming one of Hamlet's most important foils in the play. A foil is a character who, by contrast, emphasises the distinct characteristics of another character. As the plot progresses, Hamlet's hesitant state to undertake his father's revenge will markedly contrast with Laertes' furious willingness to avenge his father's death, which is in uh, Act 3, Scene 4. Act 1, Scene 3 serves to introduce this contrast. Since the last scene portrayed the bitterly fractured state of Hamlet's family, by comparison, the bustling normalcy of Polanius' household appears all the more striking. Polanius' long speech advising Laertes on how to behave in France is self-consciously paternal, almost excessively so, as if to hammer home the contrast between the fatherly love Laertes enjoys and Hamlet's state of loss and estrangement. Hamlet's conversation with the ghost of his father in Act 1, Scene 5 will be a grotesque replication of the father-to-son speech with vastly darker content. As in the previous scene, when Claudius and Gertrude advise Hamlet to stay in Denmark and cast off his mourning, the third scene develops through a motif of family members giving one another advice or orders masked as advice. While Polanius and Laertes seem to have a relatively normal father-son relationship, their relationships with Ophelia seem somewhat troubling. They each assume a position of unquestioned authority over her. Polanius treating his daughter as though her feelings are irrelevant. Affection, who? You speak like a green girl. And Laertes treating her as though her judgement is suspect. Further, Laertes' speech to Ophelia is laced with forceful sexual imagery referring to her chaste treasure open to Hamlet's unmastered um, importunity. Combined with the extremely affectionate interplay between the brother and the sister, this sexual imagery creates an incestuous undertone, echoing the incest of Claudius' marriage to his brother's wife and Hamlet's passionate, conflicting feelings for his mother. The short transitional scene that follows serves a number of important purposes. As Shakespeare begins to construct a unified world out of the various environments of the play, um, whereas the play up to this point has been divided into a number of separate settings, this scene begins to blend together elements of different settings. Hamlet, for instance, has been associated with the world inside Elsinore, but now he makes appearance, uh, but now he makes his appearance in the darkness outside it. Likewise, the terror outside the castle so far has been quite separate from the revelry inside, but now the sound of Claudius' carousing leaks through the walls and reaches Hamlet and his companions in the night. Act 1, Scene 4 also continues the development of the motif of the ill health of Denmark. Hamlet views the king's carousing as a further sign of the state's corruption, commenting that alcohol makes the bad aspects of a person's character overwhelm all of his or her good qualities. And the appearance of the ghost is again seen as a sign of Denmark's decay, this time by Marcellus, who famously declares something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Finally, the reappearance of the still silent ghost brings with it a return of the theme of spirituality, truth and uncertainty, or more specifically, the uncertainty of truth in a world of spiritual ambiguity. Since Hamlet does not know what lies beyond death, he cannot tell whether the ghost is truly his father's spirit or whether it is an evil demon come from hell to tempt him toward destruction. This uncertainty about the spiritual world will lead Hamlet to wrenching considerations of moral truth. These considerations have already been raised by Hamlet's desire to kill himself in Act 1, Scene 2, and will be explored more directly in the scenes to come. The ghost's demand for Hamlet to seek revenge upon Claudius is a pivotal Ill event of Act 1. It sets the main plot of the play into motion and leads Hamlet to the idea of feigning madness, which becomes his primary mode of interacting with other people for most of the three acts, as well as a major device Shakespeare uses to develop his character. Most important, it introduces the idea of retributive justice, the notion that sin must be returned with punishment. Claudius has committed a sin, and now, to restore balance to the kingdom, the sin must be punished. The idea of retribution haunts and goes characters throughout the play, functioning as an important motivation for action, spurring Claudius to guilt, Hamlet to the avoidance of suicide, and Laertes to murderous rage after the deaths of Ophelia and Polonius. 
While Hamlet fits a genre called revenge tragedy, loosely following the form popularised by Thomas Kidd's earlier Spanish tragedy. Now, I had to do an essay on this, so this is why I kind of roughly know a lot about this bit, but it's very important. It is, like un it is unlike any other revenge tragedy in that it is more concerned with thought and moral questioning than with bloody action. One of the central tensions in the play comes from Hamlet's inability to find any certain moral truth as he works his way towards revenge. Even in his first encounter with the ghost, Hamlet questions the appearances of things around him and worries whether he can trust his perceptions, doubting the authenticity of his father's ghost and its tragic claim. Because he is complaintive to the point of obsession, Hamlet's decision to feign madness, ostensibly to in order to keep the other characters from guessing the motive of, for his character uh, and his behaviour, will lead him at times perilously close to actual madness. In fact, it is impossible to say for certain whether or not Hamlet actually does go mad, and if so, when his act becomes reality. We've already seen that Hamlet, though th thoughtful by nature, also has an excitable streak which makes him erratic, nervous and unpredictable. In Act 1, Scene 5, as the ghost disappears, Hamlet seems to have too much nervous energy to deal complexity with the curious Horatio and Marcellus. He's already unsure, uh, he's already unsure of what to believe and what to do, and the tension of his uncertainty comes out in sprawling wordplay that makes him seem slightly mad, calling the ghost names such as, oh, you know, to True Penny and Old Mole as it rumbles, swear from beneath the ground. So that was it. That was part three of Hamlet. Next up, I don't know what video is next up. I would love to tell you what it is, but I can't remember. So I will see you either on Thursday or Monday, whenever this goes up. See you then. Bye.